the sinner, the hypocrite, for we know that they're not ready for the coming of the Lord. And if the Lord would come, they'd be left behind to face seven years of God's judgment in the tribulation period. This sermon, the Holy Spirit is directing it to every servant of God. So if you count yourself to be a servant of God, listen closely tonight. The title is, One Will Be Taken, One Will Be Left. Which one will you be? The starting scripture is found in Matthew, chapter 24, verses 40 through 42. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Throughout the New Testament, it is made clear that Jesus is coming back to earth. His mission is to take a particular people to heaven, a people that he counts worthy to be taken to heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. When Jesus returns, he will not come all the way to earth. He will appear in the sky. And when the trumpet of God sounds, first, those that died in the Lord over the years, their bodies will come up out of the grave. And those corruptible bodies will be transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost and made glorious and incorruptible. And then those bodies will be reunited with the soul in heaven forevermore. Afterwards, those who Jesus is coming for, they will not die, but rather they will be changed. Their bodies instantly glorified, and they will rise through the air caught up to meet Jesus in the sky. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the Apostle Paul gives further detail of Jesus' return to earth and how it will transpire. 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 51 through 53. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Jesus himself spoke of his return to earth. And when teaching people of his return, to help them understand, he likened the event of his return to things in this life that people can easily identify with. For example, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 44, Jesus said, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Jesus declared that no person would know the time of his coming. So anybody across this earth that claims to know when Jesus is returning, really they're calling Jesus a liar. These are individuals that are seduced. They're deceiving others and they're deceiving themselves. Now, Jesus said, we would know the season of time by the signs he gave in Matthew 24. And he said, when you see these signs come to pass, look up, watch, be ready. And these signs are being fulfilled all around us on a daily basis. We live in a period of time that Jesus could come at any moment. So we must get ready, 
stay ready, and then help others to get ready. In this scripture reading, Jesus likens his return to a thief coming unexpectedly to steal away valuables from a household. And the servants of the house must be alert and watching at all times. Then in Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 47, Jesus said, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over his household. Here Jesus likens his return to a master of a household that is returning from a long distant journey. And the wise and faithful steward of the household is to be doing the will of his master, watching and making ready for his return. Then in Matthew 24, verses 48 through 51, But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now notice Jesus, his own description of his second coming to earth, details the fact that he is not coming for everyone on earth, only his servants. And it further details that he is not coming for all of his servants, only those servants he counts worthy, only those servants that are watching and making ready for his return, those servants who are a blessing to their fellow servants. All other servants, Jesus counts as being wicked. Again, remember, we're not talking about sinners or hypocrites, but unfaithful servants that will receive the same punishment, the same portion as the hypocrite. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now Webster defines watch as the act of keeping awake to guard, to protect, or to attend to. This definition tells us that to watch is not a passive duty. To watch as Jesus instructed is an active duty. That is, to guard and protect your soul and mind. To guard and protect your fellow servants. That all in the household may be alert and ready when the master appears. Also, watch means to attend to. That is, to attend to your duties as a servant of the Lord. To attend to keeping the master's house in order. To attend to helping and caring for your fellow servants. To attend to your God-given talents, making sure that you're using them to build the kingdom of God. Those servants that are not worthy and are unprepared for his return, these are the unfaithful, wicked servants that are without love for their fellow servants. These will be separated from the faithful servants when Jesus makes his second appearance, then punished with the hypocrites by being left behind on earth to face seven years of God's judgment. And they will endure, as the scripture says, weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is significant because weeping and gnashing of teeth signifies great sorrow and remorse, coupled with intense pain and agony as they suffer under the judgments of God along with the sinners and hypocrites. Now, the New Testament gives more information that distinguishes those who will be taken in the rapture from those who will be left behind. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Speaking of Jesus, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Jesus is coming for a glorious church, a people that have been sanctified and set apart from the world by his word, truth. A people that are holy in his eyes, whose spiritual garments are without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Those caught up to meet Jesus in the air at the rapture will be united with him as a groom is united with his bride in a marriage ceremony. Upon their arrival in heaven, a great banquet will be waiting prepared for Jesus, the Lamb of God, and his bride, the glorious church. Now on earth, members of the bridal company carefully made themselves ready for Jesus' return by keeping their spiritual garments undefiled and pure and by watching and making ready for his return. So when they arrive into heaven, for the great marriage banquet, bridal company members will receive fine linen, white and clean, to clothe themselves for the great banquet. And the fine linen represents their pure and holy lives on earth. Revelation chapter 19, verses 8 and 9. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. It is blessed to be called to such a glorious event as the marriage supper. It is blessed to be called to be a member of the bridal company. However, as Jesus declares in Matthew chapter 22, verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. Not everyone that is given an invitation to the great marriage supper will accept it, for there will be those who will turn a deaf ear to the invitation. And I take you to Matthew chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. There will be people also that will try to accept the invitation without meeting God's requirements, seeking to blend in and conform with the true bride, with the chosen of God, where in reality they're acting the hypocrite trying to gain access to the great marriage banquet without the wedding garments that are pure, clean, and undefiled by the sins of this world. They do not possess such righteous holy garments because their lives on earth did not meet the standard of God's word. However, God knows those who are his. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 8. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all, as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Notice this man, who was cast out, was without a wedding garment. 
His life made him unworthy to receive a wedding garment. And so, at the table, he sat speechless before the king. This man could not speak the love language of heaven. This man did not wear the love bridle, and his conversation made him unfit and unable to utter a word before the king. You know, the Bible tells us in James chapter 1, verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because that is, as it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And finally, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God reveals even more as to what separates the servants who will be taken in the rapture from those servants who will be left behind. And in the 25th chapter of Matthew, Jesus gives the parable of the ten virgins. Five virgins were wise. Five virgins were foolish. Now, all ten were virgins, representing spiritual purity, undefiled by the world and sin. However, take note that in this parable, Jesus identifies exactly what separates the five virgins who were wise from the five virgins who were foolish. The five wise virgins possessed oil in their vessel to give light unto their lamp. The five foolish virgins possessed no oil in their vessel. They had nothing to keep the light burning in their lamp. Jesus then says at midnight, the cry goes forth to the ten virgins. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And all the virgins arose at night to go forth to meet the bridegroom. Now the five wise virgins, with oil in their vessel, they were able to light their lamp, providing light that they may see their way to rapture ground and the coming bridegroom. However, the five foolish virgins who were without the oil had no light to see their way to make it to rapture ground to meet the bridegroom. So the five foolish virgins went to buy oil. And as they did, the groom came, and he took with him the five wise virgins with oil. Matthew 25, verses 10 through 13. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. In the Bible, oil represents the Spirit of God. And in order to be taken when Jesus returns, not only will you need to be spiritually pure and undefiled, but you must be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit. You must be baptized in the Holy Spirit according to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Take on the wisdom of God in preparing for Jesus' return. Be wise in your master's eyes and make sure you possess the oil of the Spirit in your human vessel. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul reminds the church of their responsibility before God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. The person of the Holy Spirit will not occupy an unholy vessel. That vessel 
or that temple must be made holy as God himself, and that can only be done through the power in the divine blood of Jesus. And only then will the Holy Spirit come into a vessel to dwell there. On earth, Jesus possessed the Holy Spirit in his vessel, and before he ascended back into heaven, he commanded his disciples to not start his church, to do no duties for him until they received the oil of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the words of Jesus, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. When the oil of the Holy Spirit fills your vessel, great power comes with it. Holy Ghost power to enable you to work for the Lord and use your talents for Him. Holy Ghost power to enable you to do the whole will of God. Holy Ghost power that makes you a Jesus witness. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The oil of the Holy Spirit will burn within you, making your Jesus light shine bright in this dark world of sin and unrighteousness. And this Holy Ghost power will also help you stay awake and be alert as the midnight hour approaches. This Holy Ghost power is the power that will change you in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye when Jesus comes. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Now I want to take you back to the 25th chapter of Matthew. Here Jesus gives another parable that illustrates the difference between servants who are taken in the rapture and servants who are left behind. Beginning in verse 14, Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven as being a man who is about to embark on a long journey in a faraway country. However, before leaving, he calls his three servants together. Now to each servant, he gives talents. To one servant, five talents. To the second servant, two talents. And the last servant, one. Each servant the Lord gives talents to according to their ability. And then he takes leave for his journey. Now while the master is away, the servant with five talents goes to work, increases them. And they multiply to ten talents. The second servant who was given two talents, goes to work, increases them, and they multiply to four talents. And the last servant who took the talent that was given him, the Bible says he went forth and he buried it in the earth. And after a long period of time, the master returns, and he inquires of his servants as to what they did with the talents given them. Now the two servants that went to work and used their talents and increased the kingdom of their master, were welcomed into that kingdom and given great blessings. Matthew 25, 23, His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then the lazy servant the one that refused to do anything with his talent and instead buried it. This servant was stripped of what was given him, and then he was punished by being cast into outer darkness of the tribulation period. Matthew 25, verses 26, 28, and 30. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice the Lord counted his servant 
as being wicked and lazy. Remember, this again, this is not a sinner or a hypocrite, but a servant that refused to use the talent given him by his Lord. This servant was not taken into the Lord's kingdom, but rather left behind to face seven years of God's judgment during the tribulation period. As you can see by this sermon, there is much in the Word of God that distinguishes, that separates those servants that will be taken in the rapture from those servants who will be left behind. And in closing, I want to take you again to the starting scripture, Matthew 24, verses 40 through 42. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And in this scripture reading, each scenario, these individuals are working, they're servants. One servant in the field was taken, the other left. One servant grinding at the mill was taken, the other left. Examine your life according to the word of God. Are you a servant of the Lord? And if so, what kind of servant are you? Do you meet the qualifications of a faithful, wise servant as written in the word of God? Who is watching for his master's return? Are you a servant whose spiritual garments are without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing? Are you a servant who is wise and heeded his master's wisdom and filled his vessel with the oil of the spirit? Are you a servant who is studious, who is working to put his master's talents to use, that his kingdom might be multiplied? Or do you qualify as a wicked, unfaithful servant, a servant who does not truly believe the word of his master, therefore he does not watch and prepare for his return like he should? A servant who's allowed his spiritual garments to be contaminated in some way by sin or the world or self. A servant who is foolish and has not taken heed to his master's wisdom and refuses to fill his vessel with the oil of the spirit. Are you a servant that is slothful because you buried your God-given talent and will not use it to increase God's kingdom? Or one who is a servant without the love bridle, whose religion is vain because he smites his fellow servants with his tongue of backbiting and gossip, a tongue full of pride, envy, and boasting. One servant will be taken. One servant will be left. Which one will you be? Friend watching by way of television, listening by way of radio, understand this. Not everyone that claims to be a servant of the Lord will make it into heaven. For Jesus put it best in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, when he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. In this servant, I have revealed to you the will of the Father according to his word. Don't deceive yourself. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Yield yourself to the whole will of God and be ready and watching for Jesus' return. Friend, listening and watching tonight, if you are lacking in your spiritual life, if you have neglected the will of God in some form or fashion in your life, if you are doing or saying anything that you know God would be displeased with, right now is your opportunity to make it right with God, to come clean with him and let the power in the blood of his son Jesus set you free. Say this prayer with me tonight, you watching by way of television, listening by way of radio. Say, O oh God, oh God, I confess all of my sin before you. Forgive me, Lord, and I will serve you the rest of my life. And I believe there is power 
in the blood of Jesus that washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, Jesus. And friend, if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours tonight. Now, you need a miracle or you need a healing, the Lord wants to make you whole. It is his will for you to be made well. For when Jesus died on the cross, it was a twofold atonement, forgiveness of sin and healing for the body. He went to the whipping post, and with his stripes, you're already healed. The Word of God declares it in Peter's writings. So, you watching by way of television, listening by way of radio, if you're sick in body, if you're in great pain, put your hand on the listening device, if you're listening by way of radio, and you put your hand on the screen. This is a form of laying on of hands, and Jesus said a believer would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. And I'm the Lord's believer, agreeing with you in prayer. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring those who are sick in body, those who are in pain. God, lay a healing hand upon them. Let the blood power go into their bodies. In the blood name of Jesus, heal, heal, heal. Let that blood power flow, Lord, to each person to make them well and make them whole. For your honor and glory in the name of Jesus. And amen. Friend, watch every improvement and give God the honor, the praise, and the glory for the blood of his son Jesus that made you whole. And now, friend, you need the Holy Ghost. You know the will of your master. It's in the word. You must have the oil in your vessel to be a Jesus light in this world. You must have the oil of the Holy Spirit in your vessel to find your way to rapture ground when the bridegroom cometh. I'm going to pray with you. Get off to yourself and start praising the Lord. And I'll call this anointing down upon you and start praising the Lord with the word glory and praise him continual, continuously with your whole heart. And as you do, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. His power will settle in. And when he comes in, he will change your glories into another language and he will speak through you. It is the miracle of the Holy Ghost that language being spoken through you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring the people before you. In the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Friend, keep praising the Lord and don't stop till the Holy Ghost comes in. God bless.